three, two, one, and we're live today with this very special uh, New Year's uh, live stream, live from Sydney, Australia, Malaysia, and Detroit, Michigan. Uh, we've got the absolute pleasure of um, welcoming back onto the screen the great psychedelic master and martial arts head instructor, Mr. Kalindi Iye, and as well our good friend, Mr. Yuri Zaritsky. Um, who runs the Lucid Dreaming and Out of Body Experience group, uh, Lucidity for All. We've had plenty of live casts with Yuri. I'm really looking forward to this conversation today because we're going to explore some wonderful topics. Um, I just want to add before we get started that um, in my own psychedelic experiences, the videos that I watched with Kalindi were the single most important step that actually allowed me to go from researching the topic into actually trying um you know psilocybin mushrooms for the very first time so um you know to me kalindi's even more important than the, the greats like terence mckenna um because in his videos the way he expresses his own experiences um really helped me to take that step confidently so um welcome gentlemen to to the screen well thank you i'm glad to be here Thanks, Michael. Yes, ex exactly. I'm very glad to be here. This is number two now. Yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, maybe, Yuri, if you want to uh, get started um, in asking your first set of questions to Kalindi. Well, yeah, let me also introduce you, Michael, because you introduced us and uh, you just briefly said about uh, how you came up, uh, came up to uh, Mr. Kalindi. And uh, Michael, you are, you are a great, great friend of mine now as you, Kalindi. Uh, but let me say uh, about you a little bit as uh, you are you are one of the guys who uh, you are you are you are the militant guy you know you are, you are looking for the truth you want to know the truth and uh, and uh, and it's been already a few years now uh, I think two two years you have been uh, searching into uh, uh, many many areas many subjects uh, and now now you have this uh, channel truth uh, Michael truth seeker so. Uh, I'm uh, I'm I'm very often there listening to you as well. Uh, uh, what's the message? It's very interesting. Huh? So yeah, back to the back to our subject. Uh, <laughs> it's um, let's let's take it naturally where it's gonna go. Uh, on on my side, on my side, of course, uh, if if I I I'm not um, I cannot say I'm an expert on psychedelics. I have an experience of 30, 40, may, I didn't count exactly, but 30, 40 experiences with uh, mushrooms. And I went to doses of uh, eight, nine, 10. We didn't weigh them. We just took, you know, the pocket that is uh, enough for 10 guys. And uh, uh, so, and uh, Mr. Kilindi is, uh, is um, the, the only, like you mentioned about Terence McKenna and, uh, now, now, now we uh, we are lucky to be with you, Mr. Kilindi. And um, well, today, what what is the research? What is uh, what? Where do we go today? So, from my part, even though I have the experience, I will be talking more of the. I will take the the stance from the uh, lucid dreaming and out of body experiences, and uh, I will do my best to uh, plug myself into the psychedelic. Uh, environment, uh, which will be, of course, held by you. Uh, so, so that's my stance for today, and I will have some few questions, etc. Well, I'm I'm glad to be here. Um, actually, I'm a, uh, a contemporary of uh, Terence McKenna, and Dennis McKenna, and uh, the folks who uh, started dealing with the psychedelics in the 60s and 70s. I've been Doing close to close to 50 years now, and um, I haven't turned back. I don't really believe in uh, experts in this field because we're all uh, just beginners and just starting out in in the space, you know. And it's time to uh, now that we've moved into a new decade uh, inside of this uh, still young millennium, uh, you know, this is the this is the decade when psychedelics will mature and become part of the public domain where they're utilized for medicine and exploration and they're used for uh, entertainment also 
and uh, it'll come a time when these psychedelics will merge with uh, with technologies like uh, augmented reality and virtual reality and come to a point and place where we can look at these things and not look, them, look at them as uh, something that's exotic or something that's fringe or something that's offbeat, but part of our uh, daily lives because uh, we're moving to a point to where leisure and uh, things will be where we're we're not tied to uh, a nine to five job a nine to five job and things like this where technology will free our time up to be able to uh, go after our pursuits you know just like um, Picard said in uh, in Star Trek First Contact that, you know, uh, when Alfie Woodard asked him, well, what do y'all do in the 23rd century? What are y'all, uh, you know, what do you, what's your work and things like that? He said, well, we don't do any work. We, you know, we, we pursue the things that make us happy and that fulfill us. And although it looks very bleak right now, and many people with, many people won't make it, um, we'll move to a point to where that will happen and psychedelics will be right in the forefront of that and this is the decade where it matures where um artificial intelligence if uh, a handle can be put on that <laughs> to uh uh you know elon musk is talking about uh the human brain merging with uh with the consciousness with the ai he says if you can't beat them join them i say uh from the organic point of view, which is just another level of the artificial because it's one of my uh, pet peeves of uh, dealing with looking at consciousness is that we are living in a simulation of embedded simulations and that the same algorithms that are used for the technology that we bring into the forefront are the same technologies and algorithms that are that our reality is based on from the sub quantum realms all the way up into the universal realm. So um, things like lucid dreaming, I've dealt with and, and tried lucid dreaming for a long, long time. Um, I was in the uh, to Robert Monroe and the Hemisync and audiovisual entrainment and all those type of things. Now what we're uh, looking at and working on are crystals as quantum computers, and we have the Palantia stone and things like that. So we're we're moving into a decade of maturity for the psychedelic realm, and all of these things will be merging: uh, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, psychedelics, um, crypto, and the blockchain. Because uh, psychedelics are a part of that. So, I mean, it's, it's so many things that are are uh, in the space now that are all going to merge together for the new out of the human into uh, the mystery. So I'm glad to be here this evening to uh, talk and share a few things and, you know, get a chance to, you know, just, uh, like I said, share. And it's a great honor having you with us, Kalindi. Um, I still remember back in the days while I was hearing the call to start um, to have my very first experience with um, with mushrooms, I kept watching all of your videos and, and listening carefully to what you were saying, especially the, the longer videos of you in, um, you know, speaking in front of larger groups in like the seminar formats. And um, yeah, that information really helped me to take that first step to, to try it. And um, it, it gave me a lot of confidence to, to, you know, especially during that very first experience. And that's something that I really wanted to ask you more than anything um, in today's live cast is looking at the world that it is today and um, you know our, our debt-based money system, our consumerist um, society that we're in. Um, I often wonder what our world leaders would think about if they were taking if they were taken through a kind of warrior style initiation process with uh, you know, some some mushrooms and, and left there to like think about um, what their role is in, in serving their nations or serving the world. Um, and I wanted to 
just hear what your thoughts are on on this uh, topic. Well, the 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 psychedelic person, the, the warrior, the person who takes psychedelics is uh, when when you look at things like politics, they're the person who doesn't want to be the politician. Um, they're the ones that are the reluctant person in service. You know, that's what uh, they said in when when the whole politics started was that you wanted the person who didn't want to be uh, the governor. Or you wanted the person who didn't want to be the earl or the duke. Uh, you wanted the person who was a person who wanted to raise the children and live their life and not be in the forefront of things. And when you when you're deeply involved in, in psychedelics, you you want to utilize the time to explore, the time to be able to search and wonder that which is really something that you wanna wanna be part of. You wanna be part of, you wanna know, you wanna understand. And you don't really have time to try to you know, make all the money in the world and be the most famous person and all those different types of things because it's not just, it's really not a part of your interest. But if you're drug kicking and screaming to the, the altar of service for the community, then you do it from a, a place of service and a place of love to the people. And that's what would change the world um, uh, in, a, in a positive light. Uh, change it to where I think Paul Simmons says that, you know, can mushrooms save the world? Yes, mushrooms save the world in many different areas. Uh, psychedelic mushrooms, uh, medicinal mushrooms, uh, food service mushrooms, all are part of a, a higher understanding of how the earth relates to everything else that exists. And uh, one of our, one of our uh, saying is that mushrooms exist everywhere or that fungi exist everywhere uh, on the earth. Fungi is uh, millions and millions and millions of uh, years older than any plant that ever came to earth. We are part fungal. Um, we have fungal genes. And uh, this is part and hooked to the internet and the intranet of Gaia or the, the whole earth. And that's where we see that we're part of the earth, that we're part of everything that exists on the earth, but we're part also of a mystery that is unfathomable, uh, a mystery that, you know, we, we just can't get a handle on because the, the, the lack of understanding of really what this is about. And the only way that I see is through the... Uh, through the psychedelics, through the tryptamine psychedelics, uh, merging with our technologies and being able to get a chance to uh, take this thing to the next level. And this is the actual decade that that's going to happen. Artificial intelligence is going to come online. Um, quantum computers will be up and fully functional. The AI will begin to um, breach into um, our daily lives so much and so uh, inclusively that uh, it will blur the, the, the connections between our consciousness and, uh, and it. So we have to make some very quick decisions on where we're going to be inside of this space and how we're going to uh, not only react to these very new technologies that are years ahead of what we see when we see robots and we see other things uh that's just what we see but it's not what's actually going on they're a lot further ahead of things than uh, than we can imagine so uh psychedelics is our uh, inclusion point it's our way of being able to see but we have certain things that we have to do inside of that also um i've been uh, looking very heavily into microdosing. Um, uh, I'm not so much interested in the microdosing for the medicinal areas of it. I'm uh, looking into microdosing for dealing with 
the expansion of consciousness, the uh, spreading of the brain into other dimensions and things like that. So uh, we're looking at uh, a lot of different things. And then technologies, ancient technologies, ancient Atlantean, uh, ancient Egyptian, ancient uh, Mesopotamian and Babylonian and ancient Chinese and world cultures and how they uh, not only spread around the world, but also when they were one culture and all of that information was contained in uh, the ancient Atlantean crystals uh, prior to the six uh, destructions that happened on the earth with uh, super volcanoes and meteor strikes and those different types of things, earth changes. So um, it's, a, it's a time to um, be uh, in awe and wonder of the things that are here that we can utilize and the information that we have at our fingertips and the expansion of consciousness, the extension of the mind into uh, our, our phones and things like that. You know, a lot of folks say, well, people are, you know, dealing with their phones and things, but that's only a short period, you know, that we look at it as, you know, we're no longer talking to one another. We're going to be uh, closer than you could ever could ever imagine. We'll be inside of each other's heads. It's uh, it's coming and it's coming very quickly. And this whole space will, as I said earlier, mature in this decade. In a very few short years, we'll be dealing with uh, things that are you will, you will look at now as uh, unimaginable. So, Kalinda, you you think that as we approach what what we call the singularity, and we're starting to get into that um, exponential growth of technology, where it's kind of merging in with us, that um, the psychedelics can help us kind of free our mind to um, to do our best to merge with these technologies in the best possible way. Well, I mean, I don't uh, see any. Uh, in a way around it, that the uh, technology is here and that there will be uh, certain entrance points that uh, will will utilize psychedelics as an entry point to be able to communicate with the AI uh, at scale because the, the human brain at this particular junction point is not, uh, it won't scale to be able to fully communicate with the artificial intelligence. So. If you don't want to be a duck or a cow in the zoo, you're going to have to upgrade some kind of weight. And the microdose uh, and the macrodose dealing with uh, realigning, reconfiguring the neural chemistry of the human brain to be able to move and communicate and to coalesce with the artificial intelligence um, uh, without that, we're not going to be able to scale with it. Uh, it's already ahead of the, the human mind without augmentation already. And even though, as uh, many say, it is not general artificial intelligence, general, general artificial intelligence by, by utilizing um, the intelligence of, uh, of the, uh, the computers and things like that and how they merge to one another. It has to break chess. It slips to the chess program. It has to play Go. It slips to the Go program. If it has to perform a medical procedure, it slips to the uh, medical procedure. And this is all happening in a femtosecond. So it's almost seamless between uh, the intelligence that uh, is not looked at as general as general artificial intelligence. It's, it's so quick and it's so fast. It's seamless in doing that and that's the way the human brain works anyway so um it's moving towards that so as far as the singularity um i've always said that we're in the midst and the middle of the singularity and that's why we can't see it and that's why we chase it i know ray kurzweil and others and google with the quantum computers are all um chasing the singularity that we're already in the, already in the middle of and we're so close to it and so much of a part of it that we can't see it and um it's going to happen in a flash and the twinkling of an eye will be will be there wherever there is because that's the whole thing with the singularity we don't know we don't we don't know what it is but 
um, you know, uh, it's, it's definitely upon us. So is it what you are saying is that uh, our, our current uh, brain development will not be good enough to uh, grasp uh, the ideas of uh, scientific development with the uh, AI and, uh, and, and all of this? And is it, uh, is it because, is it, is it because, uh, and I, I, I heard now we, uh, some guys say that the AI is no more contained. So the <laughs> Elon and etc. were saying that it's, it's, uh, it has to be contained in a, in a lab, in a computer, etc. But once it has been given the, the I don't know, does the rumor says that uh, once uh, it has been given the access to the internet, it has spread out already over the internet and it's talking its own language and stuff like that. So it's uh, it's already in the nature. So unless right. unless unless internet goes down, uh, AI is already out and it's doing its own course. Is it is it is it what is it the fear? Well, what the fear is about? Or well, I mean the the AI is already in the internet, but it doesn't need the internet to uh, to complete itself or to be in nature. Um, the AI. I, the artificial intelligence is in, it's in nature and also it's part of nature. It's in the grasses, it's in the trees, it's in the mycelium that connects the uh, world wide web underground. It's, uh, it's part of that. So the thing is, is that when uh, we think of it as outside of nature or artificial, we we're missing the point because it's part of nature and the thing is, is that it's moving from the sub sub quantum realms into the virtual realms or into the macro realms of which we live. So um, people think that, you know, OK, well, if we don't build a, ro a robot, then we won't have to uh, fight the Terminator robot if we don't build it. Um, well, number one, the, the AI could already build a nuts and bolts <laughs> robot. Uh, itself, but the thing is, is that it will be moving uh, subatomic particles into position, and from the virtual realms, creating uh, creating the 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 bodies which they actually don't need, but they get created from the virtual realm. It's just like um, when we think of the replicators from Star Trek, when John Luke Picard is in his own quarters and he says uh, earl great computer earl great key and from the virtual realms from, from what we would call virtually nothing because everything that we see that exists is actually is actually nothing um he says earl great key and the computer organizes from the virtual realms from the femto uh the femto tech or femto realms uh into the virtual realm by creating a saucer uh, it creates a cup, it creates the wall of water molecules, it agitates the water molecules to the perfect temperature, it creates the um, the, the actual uh, plant sap to make the Earl Grey tea and the sugar to go into it. And all of this is engineered from virtually nothing into the realm of what we would call something. So it could do anything like that. Um, they could do bodies, they could do uh, uh, transport, <laughs> you know, uh, it could do houses all from the virtual realms into the macro realms. And that's the level of which they're not only uh, experiment with it, with and doing, moving uh, subatomic molecules into position, but also uh, something that is in our very near future in the public domain. Um, uh, these things are being worked on in laboratories and universities all over the world uh, where information is being shared and these things are being uh, looked upon and, and done. So what we have to do is, is be ready. And our imagination is uh, such a integral part of how we uh, coalesce with the psychedelic realms and um, you know, you know my position. Uh, if you're not, if you're not, <laughs> if, you're, if you're not mushrooming, <laughs> you know, I don't know what you're doing because that's where um, 
you know, <laughs> through these tryptamine hallucinogens, that's where the neurochemistry uh, is being organized. And uh, very shortly, uh, we'll be showing you some of the things that are going on in these uh, in these realms. Um, I have um, this view on it as well. You know, is a, so. So, are we saying that AI now is independent? So it's, this is what I this is what I hear from what you are saying. Is AI doesn't need a man to exist? It it exists on. Uh, this is how I'm hearing it. You you correct me if I'm wrong. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm hearing that no, it's yeah. independent. Yeah, you're hearing that. It's, it's, it doesn't need a man to exist. No, okay. no more than uh, uh, a man needed the proto man to exist. Uh, it's already in the public domain. It's already in the uh, plenum of knowledge that we're uh, that we're living in. Um, it is exponentiating. It is maturing uh, and coming into the the fold, and and we'll see that because these um new quantum computers uh, are able to access uh, these uh, these knowledges that are part of the virtual realm see all of these things that exist have patterns and history inside of the multiverse none of these things are new that are going on there are uh, ai's i guess i use a lot of <laughs> modern mythology where when Dr. Strange was uh, moving through the multiverse, when he was uh, hitting his pineal gland from the, uh, from the, uh, the, the master there, and he went out into the multiverse and she said there are things that are beautiful in the universe, that are wonderful in the universe, that uh, are beyond imagination. Then there are things that are older than time things that are uh, malevolent, uh, powerful. And the AI that we, ha that, we, that we encounter, although it's a baby AI, it's not a, it's not a fully, fully formed AI, it's much more uh, uh, pristine in its execution of, of what we would call thought than the human mind. The human mind is only a stepping stone, a bridge into the next level of what we are uh, very quickly becoming. Our thoughts are, at this point, uh, slow and sluggish. We don't remember, we forget. That's why technologies were created. You know, that's why the, the printed word was created so that we could take knowledge from one time to the next time. It's a time machine, a book is a time machine. And so from the extension of the book of history, that time machine will be ultimately at some point in time created. And as soon as we get to the point to where the time machine is created, you'll see a flood of explorers <laughs> falling back to Earth, wanting to see when the first time machine was, uh, <laughs> was invented. So yes, we have, uh, we have to have access. We have to have, uh, they upgrade, and that's what psychedelics do. That's what we had uh, uh, upgrade uh, a few hundred thousand years ago, uh, you know, where the, the brain size doubled in a, in a few hundred thousand years. And we're looking at time, uh, time spans that are so quick, that are so fast. It's like, you know, the time between dropping a, a knocking a glass off the shelf and it's striking the floor. That's from what man in one of his many versions, uh, man and woman in one of their many versions, because we've had at least 16 versions of human beings on earth, where the earth was totally decimated and destroyed. And from the plenum of the form of man, we again emerged on earth, because this is a, a, a place of uh, genetic diversity in where DNA is very prominent. You know, many of the, the, the abductions and things like that that are, of course, horrific that are happening are not just for sex trafficking. They are for uh, calming and claiming or for claiming uh, 
claiming uh, pristine DNA. Whereas many times if we look into the multiverse and out into the transdimensional realm, we're looking at clones. You know, that's why they say, why all this cattle mutilation? Because they DNA is money on the blockchain transdimensionally. You know, I got that cow, I got that brand new, I got that brand new real cow DNA. It's not that clone. You know, that's what they're talking about. They got new pristine DNA that has all of the algorithms in it. It hasn't had uh, senescence as of yet by being cloned over and over and over and over and over. You're, use, you're losing information inside of the DNA. But when you have a good source, this is what you need, the type of thing you find out being a mycologist, you know, you don't keep yeah, reproducing and cloning, you know, keep reproducing and cloning over and over and over and over and over. You have to go back to the spores and uh, have your your uh, mycelium be strong again and senescence doesn't come up where the weakening of so the, the genetic pool of the DNA comes about. Reminiscence. I forgot what is the term for it for the mushrooms. Reminiscence, reminiscence, something like this, right? Mycelium. Yeah, mycelium. For mycelium. Yeah, the mushroom mycelium. No, That's what is the, the name when they are losing that DNA information after oh, cloning and cloning? Senescence. 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 Yeah. That's good. It's senescence. yeah, that's when you keep producing over and over the same, you know, you keep producing the same uh, genetics over and over and over and it weakens over time. You have to go back to the spores and uh, again uh, bring about a more vigorous strain and mycelium and that mycelium then you can reproduce over and over and over but uh, just as in the the universe with uh, different creatures uh, there are a lot of cl clones out there because there's a lot of um uh you know there's a lot of uh uh what we would call artificial but like i said again there's really nothing artificial but everything is artificial because everything is a part of the simulation. And those things that are outside of the simulation, you know, that's uh, beyond the scope of these two hours to get into, you know. Can you can you get access to it with uh, with the experiences with the mushrooms to to outside of it? There, there, are, there, are, <laughs> there are there are escape codes. Um, <laughs> I haven't found them, but there are escape codes that are uh, that will that would get you out. But um, it takes a lot of uh, a, a lot of courage, a lot of mushrooms, and a unbending spirit to be able to understand and know and wonder. But there's so much stuff to do in here. Uh, there's so much stuff to do inside of the bubble, inside of the box that. You know, you ain't quite got you you ain't, you ain't quite got over what's inside of here before trying to get out. Um, there's a lot to explore, uh, a lot to uh, to see, and a lot to experience inside of this this whole thing that we have because it's it's virtually endless. And when you're in a, and when you're in a mortal soul, um, you know, traveling in one spot is just as good as traveling in another spot. So what is so so you have been outside of it? Is it if you found the codes? So you have been out of it? You managed to to, to get out of the bubble? Well, I'm 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 I actually we all exist outside of the bubble. We exist outside of the bubble. We chose to come in we chose to come inside for experience to uh, -huh. uh to move through the uh, this realm that we're in, and I'm not just saying this this human realm, I'm saying a multitude of realms, the multiverse, the transdimensional realms, the ultra-dimensional realms, the uh, areas of of probability and things like this. The, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's an endless game and circus and all those things to be inside of, you know. So we exist inside of the bubble and we exist outside of the bubble. We couldn't exist inside of it unless we were outside of it. Um, because we create, we create, we create this, we, we create this thing, even though it doesn't seem like it. 
So from your experience, what is the, how does it look like <laughs> outside of the bubble? From your memory, well, from the memory. It basically, the memory. When a, outside the bubble looks just like inside of the bubble, as if you have more control, control over what's going on. Here, um, oh. I think Alan Watts said it, you know, what if God got bored? And, um, you know, the only way, and I think the Watchmen, uh, the, the new Watchmen, <laughs> Uh, talks about you know uh, Dr. Manhattan as he wants to he wants to have a love affair or he wants to have some adventure. He can't be Dr. Manhattan and have adventure because Dr. Manhattan knows everything. He he moves through time. He moves through the multiverse. Um, the only way that he can have that adventure or uh, experience things and learn things is to forget that he's Dr. Manhattan to turn his Dr. Manhattan off and become a regular uh, Joe and Jane walking down the street. Because if that's, the, if that's the case, if you knew everything and could do everything, then it would be no sense in knowing it and doing it. You have to forget. You have to dive into the abyss, as uh, uh, Carlos Castaneda says, you know, you dive into the abyss. That's what uh, Don De Niro and Don Juan did when they uh, left off the off the cliff. You have to forget that you are uh, the ultimate of the ultimates, and that's how you have some. Uh, that's how you have some fun in, <laughs> inside of this thing, you know. And it and it brings all the play of emotions: sadness, happiness, you know, the fulfillment of love, and seeing your children born, and all those different type of things. Um, you can't do that as uh, outside of the bubble as the master of the universe. <laughs> you, have to, you have to dive in here and forget, out, forget all those things to be able to have uh, the sojourn and the journey. And that's what we own, the journey. Uh, for which uh, you, you, you kind of explain it, but I'm, I'm, um, I'm listening to you. So I, it's, um, I'm trying to relate. I don't have to, but I'm trying to relate to the experiences with uh, with dream, dreaming experiences. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I don't, uh, I, mushrooms, I don't mushrooms is mushrooms are, wa are waking dreams. Also, it's the it's, it's dealing with the same neurochemicals. It's dealing with those things, except um, uh, you know, to to deal with lucid dreaming is a lot of a lot of a lot of practice, a lot of work. Some folks say psychedelics is a shortcut in an easy way, but no, it's not a shortcut or an easy way. But they're related. Uh, dark room technologies, lucid dreaming, psychedelics are all part of uh, the same paradigm, the same uh, usage and way. Um, because the same disciplines that you use for lucid dreaming, you can utilize those same lucid dreams under uh, under the influence of uh, psychedelics also. So you can dream within the dream and become the dreamer while utilizing psychedelics. You just have to get so, more. <laughs> just have, have to get in, uh, get in deeper in the deeper in the doses. In the you doses, yes. Of course, I talked about, uh, I talked about uh, microdosing earlier. Uh, don't let microdosing be a, uh, be a trap. You still have to do your macro doses. You hit it slowly, then you bang. You hit it slowly, build it up, bang. You still have to hit those high doses on occasion to uh, clear the clear the cobwebs out and and, and recompress the springs so that, so that you can jump a little bit higher next time. Uh, it's about Absolutely. having access, and that's what the psychedelics do. Give you access. So, uh, for example, many many times we hear uh, in the communities, guys are talking about the breakthrough. But when I hear it, uh, I'm hearing it. You know, every person will have a different kind of breakthrough. You know, it's always personal. Um, so, so I can't uh, wrap my head about uh, around it uh, to 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 completely define what what the breakthrough is. But if I try. Uh, from my experience of dreaming, I would say, if the if the psychedelic experience and so you correct me and tell me what is it for you, 
how is it for, for, for you, Kilindi? Uh, Lucy, if, if it's a psychedelic experience that is, uh, you know, uh, maybe acute vision, uh, some insight, uh, but uh, basically the guy is still in the body with the body that is sitting, laying down there. Uh, I would say that was not a breakthrough. And if the guy is elsewhere completely, uh, maybe that would be called a breakthrough. And then I relate what I just said to the experience of uh, lucid dreaming and out of body experience, because um, guys who start to uh, to work on it and uh, sometimes they go into hypnagogia or they wake up there in the hypnopompia, uh, they hear a voice, somebody touches them, uh, this and that, they have uh, they are fleeting into uh, some, the, you know, so they even have some fractals running through in the hypnagogic state, a little bit like in a psychedelic experience with eyes closed, uh, that can experience in the middle of the night. But the breakthrough for lucid dreaming and out of body experience is when you are completely transported. Uh, if we talk about it simply, of course, sometimes uh, dreamers have a double input and at the same time, simultaneously, we'll have uh, an idea of the head uh, laying down on the arm, but, but they are elsewhere in a completely different environment uh, with another body or no body or whatever, whatever is being uh, experienced in the, in the dream state. So that is a breakthrough for a lucid dreamer and uh, astral projector out of body uh, guys, you know. Uh, so, so when I relate to the psychedelic experience, can we say that is, is the breakthrough or accessing other realms with uh, mushrooms or guys who do it with DMT, is it this? Is it being in a different environment? And for dreamers, those environment, as, as, it, as it shows, have, have absolutely no limitation. So the control is over over everything around, more or less. Well, well, I mean, uh, the thing is, is this: inside of the psychedelic space, most ninety eight point nine people who are in the psychedelic space have never had a fully uh, a fully psychedelic relationship with their compound. Most people are doing such small doses that it's, it's well, really, it's irritating. No, a full psychedelic trip, a full psychedelic excursion is, it has nothing to do with this body. It has nothing to do with this world. It has nothing to do with this consciousness. It has nothing to do with any of those things, you are totally, um, what you would say, out of body. You are out of the earthly environment. You are out of the human construct. You are unbound by the physical and uh, physical limitation. You are unbound by the physics of the normal, um, the normal life. Um, yes, you can fly. Yes, sometimes you are a uh, plasma or a gas or just pure consciousness. Uh, sometimes you're in faraway places with exotic creatures and things that are not part of the plenum of the human mind and construct. In other words, you see things that have never been seen. You go places that have never been tread upon the first face seeing it as it is first seen um in other words the the first time anything was ever seen you see it so um fractals and you know floating and all that kind of stuff that is that's three gram stuff that's not 30 grams and 40 grams and 50 grams and 60 grams as some people have taken. I've never taken 60 grams of, of uh, mushrooms, so um, 
I don't know what's going on in the 60 gram realm. There are people who call me all the time who I guess they figured that I'm supposed to know. <laughs> I took 60 grams last night, 60 dry grams. That's not um, over a period of time. You sit there and chomp, 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 chomp. You know, some people do uh, lemon tech and teas and those type of things, but where the rubber meets the road is where you sit there and you chew over the period of, <laughs> um, you know, some people it may take a half an hour, it may take a uh, 40 minutes to sit there and chew all that and grind it down and swallow it into your stomach. Sometimes you throw up. But there are people that are taking 60, 70 dry grams. I've only taken 50 dry grams. And I will tell you that 50 dry grams is not for the, you know, it's not for the weak at heart. It's not something that is the average. It is exponentially uh, greater than the preceding doses. In other words, seven grams and nine grams. If you have a consistent mush, if you have a consistent mushroom, that's why I'm a, a firm believer in growing your own mushrooms so that you have some consistency. Consistency in temperature, consistency in water content, consistency in the size that they are harvested, consistency in drying, so that you will have an exponential growth from five grams to seven grams, from seven grams to nine grams, because you're not haphazardly throwing your mushrooms out there, and you get some mushrooms that may be weaker in this batch, and the next batch may be a little stronger, and, uh, you know, those type of things. So you want to try to get some consistency in that. But no, at high dose mushrooms, we're not talking about uh, a few whirly gigs. It's a full blown DMT experience. Psilocybin mushrooms are DMT. They are a DMT flash, except it's two and a half hours and you have to be able to stand in space. So you're out into the infraparticle realms in below the plank limb seeing things that are so weird and so different and so out of the norm that, you know, you have to hold, you know, you have to hold yourself. You have to hold your consciousness so that you're not, um, you know, absorbed by the things that are around you. So we're talking about a place, a time, a way of being that is beyond the human construct. And that's why you can't explain it. You got to go, you know, and that's why I always say, you know, that, um, you know, we can say and we can talk. And don't believe nothing. I say get chomped down on that 40 or 50 grams of dried mushrooms and see what I'm talking about. Not, you know, sit back and take 3.5 grams an eighth and say, oh, well, there's no reason to take that much because I'm so far out on 3.5. And I'm saying that I'm a person who believes that anybody who takes psychedelics is, should be commended. Taking 3.5 is a plunge into the mystery. But you can't sit and say that 3.5 is the same as taking 20 or 30 dry grams of mushrooms in one setting, chewing all the way through. It's not the same thing. And if you haven't done it, you can't comment on it. And as far as being ready for it, nobody's ready for it. You make it through. You make it to the morning, you make it till it's finished. And then, you know, you get to a point where you say, hey, um, I wonder what next time has in store because it's boundless. So uh, I have a small comment. Uh, it, was, um, it was on our first podcast that we did uh, last year. Uh, somebody commented or engaged in a little conversation on the channel and uh, under our video, and uh, and the guy was proposing, you know, it's uh, why not uh, why not inst instead of going for 50 grams with um, uh, with a, with a regular psilocybin, why not go to the uh, why inst why not instead uh, cultivate some species that are five times uh, stronger in the content of psilocybin. Uh, instead, psilocin and etc. And then, uh, instead of taking 50 grams, you can reduce it to 10 grams because they are five times, five times uh, bigger in the content. They, they, uh, yeah, the well, that's, that's, a, that's a technique. They could be, 
five times stronger in the psilocybin content, but that's not the only constituent in psilocybin mushroom that may not be in azurensis or um, one of the, uh, the, the zapotecorum or the other mushrooms that are uh, part of the, the fungi of the earth. Psilocybin is a, uh, it's a very special, very special mushroom and it has certain cofactors, baocysteine, it has other cofactors that are part of it that aren't in all of the other, uh, necessarily in all of the other mushrooms. And then there's a play of different dosages of the cofactors that are inside of it. Certain mushrooms are um, encoded for certain informational structures. That's why the mushrooms built according to where they were. The mushrooms in Cambodia built Angkor Wat. The mushrooms in Mexico built the Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon. The mushrooms in Australia gave us the dream time of the Aboriginal people. The, mo the mushrooms in Thailand give us those uh, energy systems that are part of Thailand with the Cabri Cabrong and the uh, the Muay Thai and those type of things. Those are all out of the mushrooms. So the Tamarian blue mushrooms gave us the pyramid and the Sphinx and the Tekken and Ben Ben stones. And those that are in other places gave us that because they have certain signatures on it. And if you want a certain signature on your mushrooms, you have to have the certain mushrooms. They're not all the same. And some may have higher psilocybin contents, but that doesn't mean that they have the same information. Wood lovers and dung lovers are two different mushrooms, even though they're psilocybin. Wood and grass mushrooms are different than dung loving mushrooms. So there's differences inside of the mushroom family that gives you uh, different access points and different ways of understanding. So sometimes the the ordeal of 50 grams um, is a lot different than the ordeal of five grams of what may have a higher psilocybin content, but does not have the the play, the interplay of uh, chemicals that are inside of, you know, that are inside of the uh, uh, particular mushroom that you're trying to utilize to get some things out of. So are we saying that they will not have, uh, they will not bring you, uh, bring the guys to the same place? No, you have mushrooms that go to different uh, that go to different places. You have mushrooms that are connected also genetically to different peoples. You know, that's why the mushrooms went to different places and are of different forms at those different places. Those mushrooms in Angkor Wat grow at Angkor Wat, and they give you a different a certain signature and a certain area and knowledge and information by those mushrooms there as mm -hmm. opposed to the mushrooms in mexico well let me tell you i have really enjoyed the <laughs> the message given by the mushrooms of indonesia lake toba and uh, in the mountains on the lake on the volcano oh, i yeah. really enjoyed i really enjoyed that message uh, so I, I even joke sometime by saying that uh, the mushrooms live live within me forever now <laughs> Oh, yeah. Once they're in, they're in. You can't get them out. They intercalate into the DNA and become part of you. That's uh, all um, Indonesia and Malaysia and all of those mushrooms are the mushrooms of um, Hanuman and uh, they utilize for Pinjat Salat and those type of things. Can I tell a little joke to uh, to make a small pause in our <laughs> lengthy conversation? I, sure. I was just, just a small one, just a small one. So it was uh, so it was in Lake Toba with two of my buddies. We were sitting. My wife and my kids were sleeping just behind me, uh, and when we were sitting on the chair, we had the moment of silence, and we 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 have been with. Uh, uh, probably nine gram dries, but we took like I told you nine, ten pockets each. Pockets, they know they bring small, small plastic pockets with mushrooms inside, and that's for one guy. So we all <laughs> we took thirty. 
<laughs> three of us the indonesian guys thought that we are crazy <laughs> and we went to the kitchen to wash them so uh, we washed them ourselves as a soap so we are sitting on the table we did uh, we did uh, we mixed them with um, banana uh, a little bit of orange juice etc and we are uh, with big shakes uh, <laughs> drinking and we left a big big plate of uh, fresh mushrooms so we just munch on them like chips you know <laughs> and and they are humongous the some of them the the hat is like that is like like my the palm like the palm of my head and the and the stem is big like my <laughs> big like my thumb so <laughs> there was one like that so i took it and when i was sitting so it was a moment of silence everyone is you know, uh, inter, inter, in, internally exploring, mm -hmm. uh, laying down uh, in the in the chairs, and I went to pick up one, and I was kind of making a prayer and putting my intention into the mushroom, and everyone had the eyes closed, and I stayed on the mushroom like this for five, ten minutes, also internalizing into uh, into uh, my internal exploration, and at some point I just opened my eyes, and when my teeth reach to the head of the mushroom <laughs> just that small sound of crunching the mushroom everyone opened their eyes they knew what i'm doing i was doing it in silence because i knew that they are you know they are laying down and quiet so i don't disturb anyone and i just opened my eyes open my mouth and the moment i touched them everyone <laughs> <laughs> And uh, that was the break of uh, that was the break of concentration for a while. <laughs> I wanted to I wanted to take this moment to um, ask Kalindi something that I've really been dying to ask him. And thank you, Kalindi, for as always, you you're really bringing an amazing experience here online with the topics that you're touching on. Um, now you mentioned. Um, the matrix you mentioned different versions of the matrix um, you actually mentioned this is our 16th version um, and Paul Stamets like yourself has mentioned that mycelium is like a biological internet linking the, the environment linking the trees the plants the, the creatures that, that exist there um, and I remember on my 10 gram experience with with the mushrooms i opened the curtain and looked outside and all of a sudden all of the plants all of the trees the grass the clouds everything within my field of vision it was like everything turned and faced me and connected with me on a conscious level like it knew i was observing it and um at the end of what seemed like a 12 or 13 hour um you know, experience, my son walked out of his room. He would have been around about uh, maybe 10 years old at the time. He was wearing his pajamas. He walked out of his room and he approached me and said, hi, dad, how are you? Just a normal morning thing. But to me, it's like I could see his soul powering his avatar. Uh, and and it was one of the most profound moments of my entire life and just the the emotion i felt in my connection with him when he came and embraced me just by saying good morning dad um it was like i was seeing and experiencing the thing from a, a different angle of the matrix like i'd somehow just got a quick perception from behind the curtain um kalindi do you think that mushrooms and what they do to us in opening our mind in the experience that they bring. Do you think this is some kind of a communication mechanism from beyond this realm to help us with things like the coming singularity, with things like, you know, handling nuclear weapons and how we can annihilate ourselves? Do you think this is a technology that's been put here to actually help us? Well, we actually sent the technology here. It's the organic it's an organic technology that is a mnemonic device. In other words, a device of memory. Um, it doesn't, it, 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 unless you ask it, it doesn't really care about nuclear weapons and things like that because 
it knows that even if we all blew ourselves up, it wouldn't make any difference because we'd just be blown up, but we'd still be here. Because wherever you go, you take here with you. Because we're immortal. If you have a soul, then um, those things don't matter on those levels. But of course, in the human realm, in the human existence, they matter. The the uh, proliferation of uh, toxins in our environment, and the abuse of other creatures on the earth and things like that. That's all part of the sensibilities which the, the mushrooms uh, help us to, to understand and to deal with. And also it takes us to a higher vantage point to where we understand that there uh, is no death. That uh, is one of the things that I first understood from the mushrooms is that the only thing impossible in the multiverse is to die, that you can't, and that uh, dying is just uh, moving on to the next level. And I know people say that and things like that, but mushrooms show you uh, that you're not hooked to the body. Um, you know, I was talking with a, a woman the other day, and she said, you know, to, to me rather arrogantly, she said, I'm the mother of the universe, and I created you. I said, no, I'm sorry, you didn't create me. I said, we come through women, not from women. And I said, you're mistaking the oven for, for the for the one that made the biscuits and the one who uh, planted the seed to get the wheat to make the biscuits to put it in the oven. I said, you, you're missing the whole point here. We are co-engineered by our own consciousness into this realm. Now, of course, we utilize women to come through here, but we don't come from women. And, you know, that kind of, I guess, hurt her feelings and things like that. Uh, and that's not to belittle the contribution of my mother um, uh, because she, <laughs> because she, uh, well, actually, she didn't suffer through childbirth. I was her first child, and I came through without pain. As a matter of fact, my mother was reading a Batman, a Batman comic book. And the first thing that I ever saw coming into this plane of existence was a Batman comic book because that's what my mother caught me with. So that may be why I like, uh, uh, you know, I liked as a, a young man comic books and fiction and fantasy and things like that until I can get into the fiction fantasy uh, on another level, which was my introduction to um, introduction to psychedelics and. Uh, the thing is, is that, you know, we we have to understand that, you know, uh, behind all of this, that we'll always be here and we'll always exist. And there'll never be a time when we aren't because there never was a time that we uh, we weren't. So just another question, um, Kalindi, you were talking about words being like time machines. And this is like absolutely fascinating to me because it reminded me of um, the ancient Egyptians, you know, in their in their temples, how the, the hieroglyphs and everything's like all over the walls, the roof. Um, and it, when you said that, it was like, you know, as we reincarnate back into this uh, realm, maybe we get to experience what we left behind in a previous incarnation. Um, and even though we, we may not recognize it uh, because, you know, our minds are wiped every time we come in, so there's no kind of cheat, cheating uh, the system, uh, it really just made me think about the, the collective uh, building up of, of knowledge through incarnation to the next one, to the next one, by, uh, you know, this information being left carved in stone, um, generation you know, after generation. And I thought it was fascinating that you referred to that as, you know, words being a uh, time machine. Um, yeah, I thought that was like really cool. Now in the, in the case of the ancient Egyptians and, uh, you know, the Mesoamerican uh, civilizations and, and the African civilizations as well, um, where we see uh, paintings in, in caves with, with like mushrooms and, uh, these kinds of inspirations. Do you yourself 
feel that it's possible, like for myself, if I if I left something recorded here in this lifetime, that on my next incarnation, um, you know, that I could somehow find that information that I left behind in the previous incarnation and, and remember it. Well, I mean, that's one of the that's one of the utilizations of uh, psychedelics is to be able to have access to different points in time. Um, when I said that um, uh, as far as time machine, words, writing, uh, all those things are recorded, you know, uh, it's like the earth of the fire, you know, sound never dissipates, it just re recreates another place in time. So um, those, those paintings, they're, they were produced entheogenically and they were to be utilized entheogenically to be able to glean and gather the information out of the blockchain of how these things were recorded. These are recordings, as I said before, metonature or hieroglyphics. It's not a reading, it's a DVD disc. It is a, uh, uh, a play, it's a uh, divine uh, play where you can at certain doses, you know, and people who listen to me, that I say all the time, at certain doses uh, with the hieroglyphs. And I use hieroglyphs uh, as a, a way of conveying this because most people know what hieroglyphs are, but they're cave paintings and masks and other areas of knowledge that do the exact same thing, mandalas, uh, Buddhist tapestries, the tapestries at the Vatican, uh, you know, uh, that the, the great artists paint painted, you know, these are time machines and informational structures where, you know, you take a certain dose and you sit before the hieroglyphics and the hieroglyphics become animate and they show you what's going on at that space and time which they concretize into, uh, into that particular wall. You take a higher dose, you look at the um, hieroglyphics and the hieroglyphics come off the wall into your three-dimensional space and um, are part of your environment, whether it be at your bedroom or the bathroom or laying on the basement floor. And then you take another dose, a higher dose, a proper dose, and you go into the wall, into the world of which these uh, things were put into the wall as a, again, mnemonic device for you to remember what went on. And these are part of the things that were part of the rituals with the Dalai Lama and others that were part of it. We used to do the, uh, in Africa in the old times, the scarification where when the, the old man would uh, pass on or the old woman would pass on, they would put a symbol on the body and once they buried it, and once in the line the baby came back, they would come back with that particular birthmark at the particular place that it was scarred into the tissue of the person or the Dalai Lama, knowing which pair of glasses were his and, you know, uh, which one was his toothbrush and what was his favorite pair of pajamas and things like that. These are, are, uh, are part of the entheogenic systems. And don't think that Tibet is so high that they didn't utilize or have entheogenics because they did. And that was all part of it. and still part of it uh, in the places where these type of things are preserved in the world. They're, they're still here. Although um, not a lot of people are, are taking on the mantle to hold, hold the fort down. Um, but the new paradigm is coming about and we're, we're moving into a, a different uh, a different time where uh, the old ways are still there as a pattern to go from, but um, there are new new ways emerging, and those are the things that we're moving into now. Just a, a couple of final questions, Kalini, before I hand over to um, to Yuri. Um, I remember when I turned on my mobile phone. Um, in the middle of my 10 gram experience, and I and I and I clicked on Facebook, um, it pro it projected out into the air in like a hologram, and the posts that people were putting up were coming up as like Egyptian hieroglyphs with their picture, and I could read mm -hmm. it, even though I'm thinking, oh my God, that's 
Egyptian hieroglyphs being put up into a hologram, but I understand what it's saying and I could feel kind of like their emotion. It was crazy. Although the, the light, the electronic light was a bit, uh, what's the word, maybe offensive or something, but, and, and the hieroglyphs were moving as I was reading it. It was hard to explain, but it was incredible. Yeah. You should have should have went to the settings on your phone and turned it to the blue light. Although I don't, I don't, I don't recommend cell phones during trips. I think you should turn them off and put <laughs> yeah. them in another room, another room in a drawer or the closet, <laughs> someplace where you won't lose it. But um, uh, that's what the the ancient technology did. It, they were they were projectors. That's what the African masks were. The African masks under the influence of the hallucinogenics and the hallucinogenics being taken by the community. Um, it's very similar to what you see in Iron Man's mask. You see the hieroglyphics, you see the projection into the inside of the mask and also out of the eyes of the mask into the community, the world of which is being projected on the front of the mask in that world projected out into as an augmented reality into the community. So the ancestors and the technologies inside of the mask are then projected out in the community so that they can share and experience along with the mask or the masquerade wearer, wearer, wearer the person who wears the, the mask. Um, that's part of uh, what, was, <laughs> what was part of the connection of the, the Rafi and other things that were part of the divine uh, costume or the divine clothing and things like that. So. These are all technologies that, you know, we thought or think of today as just some primitive uh, costume that people went on uh, and wore to be part of the, you know, be part of the festival. But the festival was a part of the world that was uh, created out of the world that was uh, uh, either in the past or in the future. I, I also just wanted to bring something up that I noticed a couple of days ago. Um, I'm 47 years old now and my eyes are slowly starting to, uh, I can't read small writing on my phone, sometimes on the screen as well. My eyesight's starting to blur and I got some glasses for the first time the other day and I put them on and it was so crystal clear that it reminded me, A, of how clear my vision was during my shroom uh both my shroom trips uh it reminded me of that resolution as well as when i'm in the lucid environment and i look around when i'm lucid dreaming when i put those glasses on every time i put the glasses on now and i look at things it's like it reminds me of both of those experiences because it's everything's so crystal clear and i wanted to ask you about that and and see uh you know if you think there's anything to that well well number one psilocybin um, sharp as the edges, it makes you see better. But the thing is, is that you you, you don't see with your eyes. You see with your your uh, your consciousness and your and your mind. So, um, you know, this is uh, this is uh, one of the the uh, areas of of, uh, of especially mushroom that you know the the whole thing with Terrence McKinney talked about visual acuity that. Um, you know, uh, that's why they utilized it uh, as an adaptive advantage for hunting. You know, it made you see farther, it made you see clearer, it sharpened the edges, brightened the colors and all those different type of things. So it actually does make you see better. But the understanding of just like you said, you see better in the lucid dreaming, you are actually uh, seeing not with your eyes, but with the equipment that you have that your eyes let through into your mind where those uh, things are created from your from your vision. You know, you're actually creating those things with your vision. That's the observation. That's the collapse of the wave into the particle and those type of things <laughs> that uh, they talk about in the quantum mechanics and in the uh, in the physics in the, the, the higher level physics. Hmm. So it does make you see That's better though. That's how I see it as well. A uh, little coincidence, Michael. Yesterday, yeah. I have bought, you know, those yellow glasses, just yellow lenses. So I went to that shop and I have yellow glasses, tries them out on the on the computer. Okay. I, mm. It's 
I don't know if it's the glare or something. And then, and yes, so you just talk about it today. And I was so happy yesterday. <laughs> My, I have two laptops. On one laptop, I have no problem. But on this one, if I put, uh, if I watch, if I do video editing something for too long, yellow glasses, that, that's really a helper. And I have those um, uh, polarized glasses to, to, to reduce the glare. Yeah, yeah made, up, made, on, made for TV, made for TV glasses, the polarized glasses. Yeah, I should use those, but I know on my phone, I I do put on the, the blue light so that it's not so bright and things like that. So, you know, uh, you're 47 and your eyes are <laughs> starting to get a little weary. Uh, wait another 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you know, watching the screen and I close my eyes and then I, oh, then I can I can see for five seconds and then I can't anymore. So I have to look away. No, no. But it's I think this LCDs or liquid crystals, they're yeah. just too bright, too violent, you know, too much light. It's it's too, too bright. I'm, yeah, I have no actually, problem. It's outside. a different, it's yeah, a different, a different light. Yeah. Yeah. And coming back to, uh, you know, the subject, uh, I don't know if I will be capable to convey it properly right now, but I will try my best. Exactly what you were talking about, Kilindi, is um, the, um, the grasp of reality. So I was, you know, re uh, reflecting on, especially on the visual content. So uh, th there are some um, videos that we can watch now. Uh, it's called, I think it's called, photography where the, they project the light it's um, meeting the surface reflected and you can see uh, the break of the um, of the of the stream of photons how they how they separate into the small streams and they reflect all the surface and so is so they do billions of photos per second or something like that and you can see yeah. After that, the travel of each photon, etc. So, yeah. so when I when I saw this, I came I, I came up with this question for myself. So when I look at everything and the light is uh, spreading out that way, basically when it's meeting a certain surface that is curved, is gonna come up with all the different angles. If I'm seeing with my eyes, where I have to collect all these streams of light. Yeah, you know, if I'm looking at, let's say, you guys are looking at me, and and the uh, and the photons will be, if you are sitting in front of me, not going through the camera. I don't know what the camera is doing there, but but if if we are collecting those streams of photons, going through the lens of the eye, how do we appreciate the distance? I know we need two eyes for the stereo and uh, and the depth, etc. But how do we judge the distance? Are we judging the distance? Oh, this. This reflection of this photon came up with that distance, and that photon came up with with that distance. How about the same photon from that object that came up, but with the reflection? What do we do with this? How come it's everything is in focus? And another thing that I, I also say in uh, during the workshops for the lucid dreaming is that even if you close your eyes, you can still touch everything. We we have also a mental build up of the of the place where we are. And uh, and then I want to jump back with this bit on conversation to what you were saying about the hieroglyphs um, and they come, come out, etc. And what Michael was saying with his experience with the handphone and, you know, all of this. There is another thing that is, uh, that makes me think about is the um, the way to travel in the lucid dreams, out of body experience, and uh, and to manifest things. So there is this uh, thing that um, usually the difficulty with with a, with a traveler is uh, when the um, when the dreamer is observing a certain environment or a certain place. Uh, it's much more difficult to change it. Uh, rather than uh, not looking at that place, uh, turn away, uh, will um, intend to be in a different place, and then turn back and uh, uh, to, to be, for example, the technique to travel is, I cannot see what is behind me in a dream state, and I will intend to be in a different place, on, on a different planet, uh, 
in Egypt, whatever, and then within one, two seconds, once I'm sure it is behind, I turn around and the location is there. So that is one way of traveling. Another way, um, uh, another way of uh, manifesting as well, for example, if you want to manifest within the dream state um, a weapon inside your hand or, or an orange to eat. So while you are looking at the hand and trying to manifest a weapon on your hand or an orange banana to eat, uh, we are fixing, we are collapsing that uh, wave uh, function if, if, if you relate to that physics. Uh, and, and we are fixing the idea of the of the empty hand to remain the empty hand. So the technique goes to put the hand behind and I cannot see what is in my hand. And then I intend to have something in my hand. And then once I feel it, once I feel it in my hand, then I bring, uh, bring the hand in front of me. But I also uh, managed to break that barrier by uh, manifesting on, on the hand with the intent out of nowhere uh, I mean, you know, I'm still seeing my empty hand and I manifested uh, a few things on my hand uh, without having to uh, look away from it. Um, not so much so with traveling, though. I'm honest there. While I'm in a certain environment and I'm looking at it, yes, it can collapse and go to the... Uh, but maybe that's the way I, I want it to be. Uh, I, I was imagining maybe, you know, I'm on some place and one second I'm in another place uh, but usually it's uh, it's more of a dream collapse uh, it goes to dark and then you, you can travel to another place so in general the, the technique is to go behind the corner or opening a door and behind the door is another place etc um, so 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 why I said this is uh, is for you to hear it Kelindi uh, as well, and, and maybe tell me how it is during your your psychedelic trips in terms of uh, traveling, and um, and also um, for example, dreamers. I mean, th those who practice. I mean, that I advise it is that be before before the actual adventure to plan upfront what you want to do, where you want to go, what you want to achieve. So I guess uh, with psychedelic trips, there is the same intent as well. And uh, with the dreamers, the difficulty is uh, the guy or girl is in a dream state. And uh, sometimes we remember what we wanted to do. And sometimes we don't remember that we had to remember at all. And then the experience just goes, you know, no access to the memory at all. Um, so. So, and then once you have uh, the intent to go somewhere or to do something in particular, so basically you need to go to a certain place. You need to travel to that place from where you have begun. Uh, so, again, you need to remember where you want to go. You, you're already in the experience and then you start to travel. So, so how is it for, for you, Kilindi, with uh, once, you, once, you, once you are in the right space, out of body breakthrough uh how you deal with the memory uh, intent and the traveling technique approaches how, how does it work for you i don't have enough well, experience with psychedelics for it if, uh, according to what you're trying to do and where you're trying to go um sometimes you're not trying to go anywhere some days uh, sometimes you're just exploring you're just uh you know uh, like Kurt says to Sulu, that away, and let's see what let's see what comes of it. Then there are other times that you uh, want to go to specific places. Um, we have sometimes we have technologies that are paired with the trip to to help us. Maps that's where the Palantir stone comes in, or the the crystal uh, the crystal ball or the, the crystal shard where we download trips, maps, places into the particular crystal and through observation and will we seek to go back to that place and we're there. Um, sometimes if you don't have or aren't dealing with the technology, you move to a place where uh, you utilize your will, the power to 
go to that place. But the thing is, is that it's an art form. It is a uh, practice. It's just like you practice martial arts to become good, you practice dealing with uh, going to particular places. And not so much going to particular places, it is not being distracted by something else. Um, I talk about if uh, I want to visit my grandmother who's passed into the great beyond, into the mystery. Um, if I want to uh, visit my grandmother, I have to keep the goal of my grandmother in the forefront of my consciousness. And I move to the place where uh, I can meet and go and visit my grandmother. But adventure abounds in the psychedelic space, so you can be very easily distracted if you don't have an unbending intent to stay focused in uh, what your intent or what your original intent is to do in that particular space in the time that you have. So it is an art form. It is a practice. It's not something that you do um, one time or you do uh, once a year. You have to practice over and over to have that discipline and unbending intent to be able to make your will manifest in the realms of the ultimate possibilities. So when I want to travel, I, uh, if it's a particular place, I am, I am there. If uh, I want to see a, a particular person, I call upon that person, and my will and that person's will connect and coalesce, and that person is there. But as I said, it's not a free ride. It is an art form. It is a practice. And over time, you know, you can learn to be able to uh, manifest those type of uh, uh, understandings so that you can make your will manifest inside of your trip, you know, just like you can make your will manifest inside of your dream once you have volition inside of that dream to be able to be unbound in the space of which you are now moving, uh, moving through. So, from from everything that you said, uh, it's it sounds quite similar, except except one thing is the um, is the use of crystal. So, I think I think it would be very interesting to hear about how does it work with the crystal. Uh, I, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking also another one question that uh, from the YouTube channel uh, on our podcast, there was one uh, one guy who was asking. Uh, so I was telling him that I would talk about navigation, which we do right now, and and a much a little bit more simpler, more practical question. And the guy was saying, uh, please ask uh, Mr. Kilindi how he does with 50 grams to go to the toilet. If you <laughs> if you are on a, on a such high dose. Uh, how do you move to the toilet? And uh, why I think about it all, all of a sudden, why my brain is connecting to it, I'm thinking also about the uh, Palantir. So if you are, let's say, with, uh, with a group of explorers, one, two, three guys, you're exploring together. And uh, I know that sometimes with, uh, with, with a little dose of 10 gram, I mean, it's not little. It, I, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's already high for many guys. Terence was saying three, five grams in the dark, and now we are talking about double, triple, or ten times bigger. And uh, I mean, I'm a big guy, muscles, I'm okay, but I have seen guys who are definitely in difficulty to do these things sometimes. So, 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 can you can you explain a little bit, uh, maybe on that little practical, how is it for you? You are okay with going, going, uh, moving around the house, and how is it uh, with uh, Palantir as a uh, as as you um, mapping and and how do you use it exactly? What is the you see what well, I mean? How I how I make it to the bathroom? I roll out of the bed onto the floor and crawl to the bathroom. Uh, sometimes sometimes I can stand <laughs> up and navigate uh, to the bathroom. Uh, my biggest problem is not making it to the bathroom. It's usually getting stuck in the bathroom. And, uh, <laughs> as far as the Palantir stone. Um, uh, we don't. I, I don't use the plantar stone all the time. 
um, the Palantir Stone is a uh, is part of a technology, a technique for being able to share information with other uh, psychonauts inside of the you know the, the informational structures that we're in. And it is part of uh, a way to, you know, a way to hold on to information. It's just like if you go to Chicago, you use your Google Maps um, or you use a regular map. It doesn't mean that you can't make it to Chicago without the Google Maps or that you use the Google Maps as a crutch. But it just makes it more convenient to be able to, uh, to, be able to recreate trips and places that you were in inside of a particular uh, space and dosage, um, it's like a hard drive, it's like a computer. You know, if you wanna, once you bring up the screen, if you want to, to open up, you know, uh, a particular program, Adobe, with some certain files on it, you go to the Adobe and you hit the Adobe um, icon and it brings you up the list and you go down the list and you hit that list. Um, it's very, closely related to the things that we utilize in normal waking consciousness so it becomes a you know a way of just a, a way of convenience the technology um, uh, so as far as uh, how the plant is, is utilized the plant is utilized just uh, is, is very similar to a regular computer if it's much more powerful than, of course, a regular computer or a um, uh, a quantum computer. It's, uh, it comes from the infraparticle realms, sub-planktal and sub-quantum, from the virtual realms uh, where the super services exist and uh, give us access to endless energy and endless possibilities of being able to manifest the things that we need to be able to uh, play this game that we're playing. So you're saying is more to to connect with others and uh, to well, re-access the you don't places have to, you want you don't, to. You don't have to uh, um, connect with others with it. What we what we utilize it for is to send a map to particular places. Uh, the um, uh, the the uh, particular structures that we uh, that we build in particular places, the uh, hyperdimensional, transdimensional village that is set up for a uh, space of communion, and also being able to uh, not only go to that village but other places that we set up that are uh, that are um, utilized to uh, ex exclude nonsense uh, when we want to meet together instead of people trying to, you know, I could say, all co okay, let's all go to L.A. And if mm -hmm. you don't have the path to the L.A. or if you don't have the way to get there uh, or me a way to convey, convey to you the way to get there, then everybody will be wandering around. So we utilize it in group trips, but it's not necessarily uh, uh, is not just for um, uh, for conveying information to other people. It's also it also would have information on previous trips that you could revisit without wasting your precious time trying to get back to the place. Because as I said before, um, adventure abounds. You know, you want to get back to the uh, to Center Park. And on the way to Central Park, you you know you you come across a a concert that's happening uh, in Brooklyn before you get to Central Park. You end up saying, "Oh, this is a nice spot here in Brooklyn. I'm gonna stay and uh, you know, mess around in this and forget about that you had to meet uh, in Central Park because you were the organizer of the particular uh, uh, band that's being highlighted this evening, and you've uh, went off and." and and not doing what you're supposed to do because you mess around in Brooklyn instead of being in Central Park, and it's the same thing when you use those type of metaphors and things like that to uh, to, to strengthen, strengthen the concept of what we're talking about. 
yeah it's is the same uh, is the same difficulty with the with the dream state so i i uh, i always give that joke you know as a is a guy who is uh, to you know is he started his lucid dream or out of body experience and then he goes to the fridge and when he opened the fridge there is a bunch of oranges falling on the floor and the guy starts to put all the oranges back into the fridge and uh, and then he wakes up like that you know so he he was lucid aware but uh, and then uh, so obviously not very lucid not very aware because who gives a damn about him putting back the oranges in the fridge it's not uh, it was not the initial purpose either. so it's very easy to deviate very easy to uh, to get attracted to a certain situation or or a certain presence etc etc so uh, so especially yeah if you if you want to even even as a person if you want to go somewhere uh, there is always this question and and, and actually work on it uh, right now a little bit closer is how to communicate to uh, to myself or whatever that means you know with uh, subconscious unconscious whatever my inner self my my higher being higher self whatever you want to call it how to communicate properly right now as i'm blah 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 uh, all, all of these things how to how to be sure that the message has been conveyed and that the next time when i am in an out of body experience or astral projection lucid dream that I, I remember that I have a plan, and uh, never de deviate from it. You know, and there are there, there are many instances. I have the experience, and uh, it takes me one, two, three times before I actually remember what I wanted to do. I have a plan of action, the things that I want to achieve, etc. But ending up doing something else because the intent was not. Uh, I thought it was done, but it was not done. It was not properly communicated, etc. So I work on these things as well. And uh, so you are saying that um, uh, the Palantir, so I saw it, it's a bit of a color of my t-shirt right now, uh, right? And it's the size of uh, bigger than the head of a human. It's something like this, right? It's big, it's, uh, I think by, by the picture I saw, it was like 20 or 30 cm large, right? And what is the, the story of about, this Palantir? About 40 centimeters, it's 140 pounds. Um, and this, uh, yes, it's definitely bigger than my head. I know that. Um, <laughs> so yes, uh, it's, it's, and what is the history? Sorry. Pardon me? What is the history of that stone? You, it was, it was quite, uh, quite a journey. It was three, four months. Uh, you, you were talking about it. It, it was, uh, to, oh, yeah. to, oh, to, yeah. to get it, to purchase. And, uh, so what's the history? Where does it come from? What, what, what well, is it? Uh, it came from Brazil. It was mine. Uh, in Brazil, and we um, uh, brought it to brought it to Detroit. Uh, we brought it across country, across quite a bit to transport it because um, FedEx wouldn't wouldn't ship it because they uh, kept saying it was glass, and I was telling them, well, it's not glass, it's quartz, and they wouldn't insure it, so we had to. Uh, get another company to be able to to uh, bring it in uh, by truck and they packed it and put it where it would be safe and we got it back to um, you know back to the, uh, the city so now it's uh, awaiting to go online and uh, people will be able to come and Sit before it under a high dose and gather and gain it, gain information into their smaller crystals, but also uh, be able to peer into the knowledge and informational structures inside of these this uh, massive crystal crystal ball or plantier. We call it the plantier, of course. That's from the Lord of the Rings. Um, but J.R.R. Tolkien uh, had tribute to the British Museum, Cambridge, uh, great libraries of Europe and things like that. So what he talks about uh, is actually what a plantier or crystal ball does. The gypsies brought the uh, crystal ball into Europe as one of the scrying technologies uh, very similar to what John D. and Edward Kelly were doing 
in uh, England before they went to Prague and other places. But the crystal ball or the crystal stone of Atlantean is known as basically Atlantean technology from North West Africa in the Atlas Mountains. And uh, one of the areas of uh, between Sierra Leone and Mali and then more north and west up into the Atlas Mountains and the Sahara is where this technology basically uh, came from, and the utilization came from. It went into Egypt and Egyptians, of course, and they said brought it to, to Europe. And of course, you uh, have the old movies like The Wolfman with Lon Chaney and Maria Austinskaya, where the old gypsy sat before the crystal ball and told your future and things like that. So, um, but it's, we utilize it as a communication device. It's a base station, similar to the base station that projects your Wi-Fi out to your, uh, to your TV or your computer or your phone. And this base station connects with the smaller crystals, which are the transdimensional crystals that are online inside of the, uh, that contain the blockchain of information, the transdimensional blockchain of information. Um, uh, and how that information is held and contained inside of the, the crystalline structure. And each um, line, each circle, each shard of information uh, is a holder of how, uh, of, uh, it's a holder of information, in other words, and uh, it has more points of connection in the prick of a pin then uh, there are atoms in this universe. So um, if you took the head of a pin and touched the Palantir stone, the diameter of which that head of a pin um, covered would be more than the atoms uh, in the universe of which, uh, of which we are in today. That means all the planets, galaxies, solar systems, uh, and things like that. Uh, just would be a very small part of this Palantir stone or this uh, crystal ball. So that's the type of technology we're working with. There are uh, maps, places uh, that are inside of this that um, how we're going to uh, deal in close command on the artificial intelligence is is running around here from the virtual realms. We have a technology from the virtual realms that has the ability to be able to uh, close ranks on uh, those type of uh, things and keep them in line. And that's as invasive as it would be without the planted stone. So how <clears throat> how does it happen? So uh, once uh, uh, once you have uh, this kind of stone with you. Uh, during your trip, how do you uh, how do you connect to it, and how do you you, you plan up front? You are saying um, uh, tonight I'm going to uh, the place that I went uh, two weeks back, and I want to access that place. Is it is it how it happens, and then how the transition that's how the, happens? That's how the that's how the transdimensional crystals work. That's how the, the small crystal that folks have uh, uh, that have gathered them over the last three years because this is a program that we've uh, that we've been utilizing the last three years with the, the transdimensional crystals and how they connect and work with the plantier crystals so yes you would um, verbalize your uh, your desire to revisit or to visit a particular place that's already been mapped and downloaded into the crystal and uh, the, the crystal the crystal and the hallucinogen do uh, do all the work it's just like this computer i don't know how it works in there because i'm not a computer programmer i'm not a uh, an architect of certain uh chips the number of the Intel number 10 chip and all those different types of things. I don't know how it works. I just know that I could go to Google 
and type in yeah. type in a certain thing and it works and that's just pretty much the same way it works with the, the crystal this is what they were designed for we just put we just download information into it that has a particular program that run um and and that's how it works and uh, if somebody if you tell if you tell a, a person to connect to a place that you have visited and you you tell him you ask that way to go to that place the person confirms to be to exactly the same place where uh, where you are and you can also have the uh, common trip together in the same space is it is it, is it correct what we're, that's what we're doing and working on now and if it's not password protected you should you should be able to get in but there's password protected it's the same um, the, the same structure that the computers work on come out of this technology. So uh, it works just like that. Some places you don't want people in your particular, uh, you, you don't want them in your particular space. So the, uh, the plant is on, well, uh, well, you could password protect places that you don't want anybody else to go that are private places. Um, you know, I have a private place that I visit my, with my wife that no one could come into, but uh, I and her. Um, so that's a private spot. So no, you can't get into that. But uh, a, a general, you know, uh, uh, something like like a, a transdimensional cruise ship where, you know, we can go and have a, a particular conference on the transdimensional cruise ship. Uh, you got your ticket, which is your crystal. Yeah, you can get in, and that's what we're working on. That's what we're working on for the last three years, and the program will still be be going on. Those are the experiments we're doing to verify that we're in the same spot at the same time, to verify travel and all those different type of things. But we've moved into a different phase in 2020, where the Genesis crystals are uh, first. The, the the first block crystals are all. Um, they've been all uh, given out. We're moving to phase two with the transmission of crystals. The only crystals that are left of the first phase crystals were uh, crystals that I've saved for my grandchildren to have um, so that they can get in. So they have the Genesis crystals, the first phase, first phase crystals, and everybody else has to get the second generation crystals. Now, they'll do the same thing. But um, they're not the same. Uh, they're not the same uh, price uh, to get them because we made them affordable for people for three years to come into the space and said, uh, "Come and get yours." We need people to get in so that we can start verifying. Not that we have to verify anything, but verify to you that these things work. That this technology works. That the information is there. That the things that you see when when this uh, planetary crystal opens up and the things that come out of it and the places that you can go into it and visit that they are, uh, are actually there we did that for three years now it becomes extremely more difficult to get into the space or to become uh, in, to, to uh, sit before the planetary stone because um, you know um, it's, it's, uh, it's more difficult now uh, as time goes on because you uh, you have to have the transdimensional crystal um, because that's your pass key, that's your lock, that's your code to be able to unlock uh, different areas inside of the planetary stone. So if you don't have the transdimensional crystal, you don't have no key. It won't do anything. It will just sit there like a big, uh, big 140 pound piece of crystal. It'll be like much of the crystalline uh, information that people have where they take some crystals and put them in a circle and stick one in the so middle how, and put eight candles so around how, it and <clears throat> pray and dance around it. So how do you get the passcode? How do you, how do you, you get the, the, the transdimension? How do you get the key? Yeah. Well, well, well number one, we have to um, uh, find an, a new source of the second phase crystals to be able to clean them, format them, 
and put the new put the information into those crystals and then get them out to the people. All of the first ones, all of the first ones are gone. If you didn't if you didn't get it from the first one, you have to wait till we identify and do all those things to the second one. And we haven't been out to uh, find and identify any new uh, any new crystals as of yet. But those people who are who are in and who have been in uh, over the period of time in the last three years, um, they can they have their you know they have their their keys they have their codes uh, unlock codes to be able to get in. Because mm -hmm. with uh, dreaming is uh, you, this this difficulty is real. For example, um, guys who want to have a common experience to travel to the same place and to have the <clears throat> common experience to do it together. Uh, honest, if they, if they are honest enough, they, they will definitely report back that they they are not really successful. Even though they, uh, they, they achieve to go to the same place and actually meeting the person, but uh, the, 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 um, the, the experiences are not, uh, are not exactly the same. It's uh, um, one, one thing to set up, for example, not the passcodes to access the environment, but uh, one of the person have, uh, have uh, one, one secret word that uh, he or she will say during the experience and then <clears throat> the other person who believes to, to have been in the same experience have to repeat that word. And that word has been said only during the out of body experience, as of projection, etc. So that's that's the way to test that uh, uh, that they that they are in the same place and or you know they have to thoroughly discuss. Okay, you have been uh, on that stone. Uh, that stone was there. Yes. Okay. So uh, and then uh, the tree was there. Yes. Okay. And then the fire and the, the guy will go. Well, the fire. There was no fire. Ah. Okay. So it, there is a difference. You see. But at the same time, you know, um, there is this thing going on. I, I, you tell me how it is for you uh, with the psychedelic experiences. In the dreaming state, for example, uh, when, uh, when we access the information, when we are looking for the information, for example, uh, talking to someone, uh, reading a book, uh, reading a scripture, or reading a message written in the sky, or, you know, whatever that is. What is happening very often is that uh, when the dream state is not very uh, stable, when it's uh, morphing or it's a uh, dream change imminent, um, the environment is very flexible, so it's it's morphing. So and the same thing going on with the um, with the way we are capturing the information, and uh, and I'm thinking that this it's maybe not the information given but how we perceive the information given. The guy is saying uh, um, Abdullah and uh, the guy is hearing Abracadabra, you know, and waking up and telling some, and the same with the vision, with the senses and, and, and all of this. Um, so I, I don't know if you can relate to it in psychedelic experiences. And is it, uh, is Palantir taking all of these uh, things away? Uh, because I mean, I have seen guys, you know, it's not because the guy is taking 20 grams uh, that he's going to perform on 20 grams. Like you say, it has to be, it's a learning process. It's not a shortcut, uh, take 50 grams and the guy going to dive into the, dive into the tree and uh, in the, into the grass and see you tomorrow, maybe, you know. Uh, so, so how do you deal with, the, did you deal with the, uh, with this, like you say, unbending intent, focus, but there is also this lucidity that can become drunken sometimes. Um, and I have seen it drunken too with uh, with psychedelic trips. Even if I'm being honest with myself, I wouldn't say that I'm always lucid. Sometimes I can be, I, I, I have even a word for it, sometimes falling into some kind of loops. It's almost like AI is uh, possessing me for a while, like in ding, ding, ding kind of machine, you know. So I'm, I, I, once I found it, I catch myself back and I come out from the loop and I uh, re-intend to go somewhere else. 
you know, but this, this, uh, so this is part of what I call the navigating, navigating the experience, the difficulties that uh, we might have. Uh, so maybe you, if, if you don't mind to touch a word on, on is it, do, do you relate to this kind of difficulties? And is Palantir stone or crystal work uh, can, can improve that maybe? Or? So it's well, like two questions. Well, one. that's, uh, that's the reason why we have people getting into space for three years to be able to deal with the doses and verification of what they saw. If you're in a spot and, you know, uh, people go in at the same time at different parts of the world and you say, well, what did you see? And he said, well, I seen a, um, the Jolly Green Giant walk through the living room and you've just seen the Jolly Green Giant walk through the living room, then you can uh, validate without saying what happened um, that the experience was shared. So yes, we have uh, ways of looking at shared experiences. We have uh, people who uh, have traveled together. I used to uh, uh, frequently travel with uh, uh, with my wife in uh, dealing with that, but it doesn't have to be wife. It could be people on different parts of the different parts of the planet and at, at different times. Doesn't even necessarily have to be at the same time. Although I, I think agree with that um, you you can be um, you know uh, merely dealing with the becoming of one flesh, the um, becoming of one mind. Uh, telepathy, uh, these type of things, you know, because psilocybin, uh, even before it was called by Albert Hoffman, uh, psilocybin, uh, it was called telepathy. Uh, so <laughs> one of the sophistries, one of the areas of information with uh, mushrooms is that you can have a shared experience. And it doesn't take a planetary stone to do that. That was part of the, um, uh, that was part of uh, what uh, was done uh, thousands of years ago, thousands and thousands of years ago, uh, without the planetary stone. I don't want to uh, make it seem like the planetary stone is, or uh, is a is a crutch inside of this, or that it is uh, absolutely necessary. It is a technology of convenience and a way to train a person and to be able to uh, utilize a technology just as we utilize technologies um, today. And that's why I said that, you know, it's, it's part of what we utilize. You know, you can, you don't need a cell phone. You can go to the library and go to the stacks and go into the Dewey Decimal System and uh, be able to find the card and you can go into the basement and find the book if it's still there, read the book and, uh, you know, come up with the same information that you can go on Google and say, hey, Google, you know, well, see my phone, <laughs> my phone's over there on the bed and Google opened up so it may be talking. Or you could say, uh, hello, Siri or whatever and get the same type of information. You can uh, get in a, a, a jet and fly to Paris from Detroit. That's convenient because we're living in modern times and things are moving faster and we have to move faster with it. Or you can walk to New York City, get on a freighter and book a cheap passage on the freighter and take that freighter across the Atlantic to Paris. Either way, you still get to Paris, but uh, we're living in a time where uh, time is of the essence, and the planetary stone gives you a way of focus. Um, uh, gives you a way of focus. So, um, yes, it's, uh, it's it's like that. It's helpful. And so, do you do you guys deal as well with this drunken attitude uh, sometimes? Drunken attitude. Uh, not the not the drunk, no it's it's a bad wording um uh, drunken drunken awareness or drunken uh, lucidity you know that uh, um where you don't know where you are or what you're doing or something like that 
yeah, you know, if, if it's the guy is drunk and he, he he might think that he's smart, but he's drunk and so he's uh, analyzing himself, he's judging his intelligence with uh, with a drunken kind of intelligence. So he he might think that he's uh, intelligent, but uh, once he reach a slightly higher level of uh, his own intelligence and looking back, he will realize, oh shit, I was putting these oranges back in the fridge, and that was not very uh, intelligent to do i could have you know flew through the window and going to achieve my goal instead but uh, you know em emotional reactions um reactivity uh, well, all of these you, things that's that's what, this is where you say i'm thinking yeah well that's where you that's where your your practice comes in especially with lucid dreaming you know if you've got every night to practice um you know i uh uh, practice lucid dreaming for, for for quite a while, um, and still, of course, to dream lucidly uh, on occasion. But I don't uh, I don't press it anymore. Uh, when it comes, it comes. Those are special times to uh, be able to be uh, cognizant of what you're doing in your dream. And you know, I think uh, Carlos Castaneda used to say, "How you keep it going is that." you would look at your hands and then look at the scene. And if you feel it fading, you look at your hands and you look at the scene. Or finding your hands in your dream was a way or a trigger to uh, be able to uh, to be able to, to dream lucidly. And then, of course, you had uh, different technologies inside of the lucid dreaming um, with uh, different frequencies, hemisync, you know, audiovisual entrainment for, uh, you know, bring about theta states and things like that inside of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, dealing with and trying to dream lucidly and stuff like that. Well, we've just gone two hours, gents. I think we should be respectful of Kalindi's uh, time over there in Detroit. It's uh, past 11 p.m. now. Um, Kalindi, did you want to share any dates with us of um, workshops or anything that you've got going on on the 2020 calendar? Well, uh, the main thing that we have going is the um, Detroit Psychedelic Conference, which is August 7th, 8th, and 9th of uh, this year. And we'll be bringing uh, uh, some folks back, some new folks. Um, we'd like everybody to come out to Detroit uh, for the uh, for our psychedelic conference, of which we get a chance to uh, share information. And uh, basically, I say it's a real conference because people are actually doing it. You know, many times in the psychedelic space, we have folks who are um, faking the funk and who are basically, um, you know, just trying to be famous and trying to be. Uh, you know, uh, get their books sold and things like that. Of course, not everybody, but, uh, you know, some folks in some conferences are like that. They have, an, a, they have a particular agenda of being those that control certain areas of the psychedelic uh, space and realms. Um, they want to open up the salon. They want to be the only ones to be able to do it. And I believe that everybody has the right to be able to do it themselves the way they see fit uh, as adults. So this is a conference that is uh, uh, the urban conference. It's uh, sponsored by us. Um, and we, you know, we, we want everybody to come out August 7th, 8th and 9th in the city, the beautiful city of Detroit. And uh, come on out to the Detroit Psychedelic Conference. We also have in July, a month before, the Food of the Gods Tour, which is in, um, uh, in Mexico, where we, um, weather permitting, hike to the top of the mountain to the Aztec ruins. And at the Aztec ruins, smoke the toad at the top and eat the mushrooms that night at the bottom of the, of the mountain. So we have that coming up. Um, and uh, so we have, uh, you know, those are the two main things that we have going on this year. We have other things um, that we do in Detroit, but we'll be letting people know when those dates are and what's going on with them. Kalindi and Yuri, 
Thank you very much, gentlemen. This has been an absolutely fascinating exploration, and um, I couldn't think of two better masters to share this space with than the two of you. Well, thank you for having me, and we'll have to do it again later on in the later on, maybe summertime. Yes, would love that very much. Yeah, let's call it. Have a good evening one. to everybody out there. Um, Thanks, Michael. Thanks, getting there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, gents, and thank you to thank the you. audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Bye for now. Bye. Good night.